and welcome to this debate for California Assembly District 8 between George Donovich and David Tungipar. My name is David Taub, senior reporter with GV Wire. For the next hour, we will discuss several issues of interest. This is an open seat as Jim Patterson will be termed out. The district includes most of North Fresno, Clovis, and several mountain communities. Both Rodonovich and Tungipa are Republicans and have had sharp words for each other. I want to cover as much as possible over the next hour. I won't have strict time limits, but I ask the candidates to keep the answers concise. My only hard and fast rule? Try not to talk over each other. So let's meet the candidates. George Rodonovich of Mariposa is a former congressman representing the Central Valley from 1995 through 2011. He also served as president of the California Fresh Fruit Association. David Tungipa of Clovis is a field representative for Fresno County Supervisor Nathan Magsig. He played tight end at Fresno State, earning several academic honors. I want to thank our partners at CMAC, the video and technical wizards who made this evening possible. Gentlemen, let's get started. Gas prices is the news. Last week, the state legislator approved a law that they said would prevent gas price spikes. Uh, do you agree with that legislation? Uh, let's start with you, Mr. Donovich. Well, they're going after the wrong people. I get, uh, for a gallon of gas, the oil industry gets about seven cents of it, and the government taxes on that is over dollar eighty, and they're going to go up. And for them to be able to go after the oil industry for price gouging is uh, is just disingenuous. And the problem is, is the fuel taxes and AB thirty two that mandates the. Uh, incredibly high gas tax to try to get us off of fossil fuels and over to wind and solar, which is not going to happen. Mr. Tungy, I say, uh, looks like you probably would say voting no if you were in the legislature. 100 percent. I think this is an area where George and I really agree on. California and what they're doing right now doesn't make sense. We have the highest gas uh, costs in the nation. So we know that Sacramento shouldn't be controlling these areas. And I've worked with Senator Shannon Grove to really promote and push these. She had a bill this year called SB 15, which really focused on using the refineries here to produce the gas that we need, because that's how we save on costs, by keeping California energy here. We know that Sacramento can't deal with it. They shouldn't have the power on that part. We're seeing higher and higher gas prices. Let's not give power back to those same people who are making it so much harder for us. So Mr. Donovich, he had uh, some ideas on how to uh, save prices at the pump. What would you do to lower gas prices? Oh, I think I'd remove the taxes that are on there, I, you know, and the tax increases that are coming. We have to embrace fossil fuels. We're never going to be able to, to leave them. And uh, solar and wind will never account for more than 40 percent of our energy profile. So we have to embrace the industry. Like I said, uh, like David has said, you've got to be able to produce here uh, under, under circumstances that are far more environmentally friendly and uh, in, in produce more so that the price of fuel goes down um, and, and repeal AB 32, the global warming initiative. Right now the counter argument is made that, you know, gas prices help pay for the roads. So if you get rid of the taxes, how do you pay for the roads? Less so now because, uh, because of fuel efficiencies and stuff. That doesn't account for much of the roads now. Unfortunately, Sacramento's pulled all that uh, uh, income away from the counties, and they're usually getting for county roads mostly grants uh, that are made available through the state. So um, the gas tax doesn't account for road improvements like they used to, unfortunately. Mr. Tungipa, how'd you pay for the roads? Well, I just again, we have to look at fiscal responsibility here in California. We have the highest gas tax in the nation, but do our roads reflect that? I don't think so. And so it's not trusting the same individuals to keep doing the same job and expecting different results. We can't do that. We can't empower Sacramento to do that. So we should focus on our roads uh, individually here. It's something that Fresno County has focused on. It's something that by empowering our locals, they can take care of our roads better. Are we seeing the amount of gas that is being used here on the gas tax for the Central Valley? I don't believe so. We have not gotten ours. And so working with people like Senator Grove, we do need to pull off the gas tax and repeal the gas tax because it is not servicing the people here in the Central Valley. Okay, real briefly, you mentioned, uh, you know, help, self-help. Mm -hmm. uh, measure C, it's uh, due for renewal soon. I think maybe 2026. Uh, Mr. Tungabay, do you support a Measure C renewal? When it comes to Measure C, I believe keeping, we, I don't support any state taxes and I really support just keeping it to local control. But, so is that a yes or a no? When it comes to Measure C? Yeah. I support Measure C. And Mr. Rodonovich? I vote in Mariposa County, so it's really not an issue well, for but me. You're, well, but your, your constituents are going to be in Fresno County. I would look for every way to be able to use state funds to build county roads. All right. 
gun control, another big issue in the state that always comes up in the state legislature. Um, you know, why don't you briefly summarize your stance on control? We'll start with uh, Mr. Tonkipa. Yeah, well, I'm proud to be endorsed by the California Rifle and Pistol Association because of the work that we've done uh, protecting our Second Amendment rights. We have to protect our Second Amendment rights, mainly because we see the crime issue that is devastating people across. The government cannot protect us, and our first line of defense is ourselves to protect their own families. And California keeps going after, and they're using the terms, gun violence. Uh, there's no such thing as tool violence. There's no such thing as car violence. That's not how it works. These are criminals, and the best way for us to protect ourselves is the Second Amendment. I am, again, proud to be endorsed by the California Rifle and Pistol Association to defend our Second Amendment rights. And Mr. Donovich, uh, summarize your position. Uh, pretty much the same. I've got a record to prove it. I served 16 years in Congress representing the people of the valley and the mountains, and uh, they have a 100% rating with the NRA, solid, uh, always been a, 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 a strong advocate of uh, Second Amendment rights, and truly it is. It's, uh, it's the, it, I think the, the problem with increased crime has been the, uh, the uh, uh, fracturing of families and uh, the, the increase in dysfunctional and, and broken homes. And uh, people resort to violence of any kind. Like, like David said, it's, it's gun violence, it's knives, it's everywhere, it's everything else. It's not, the, it's not what you're using, it's kind of the society that we've become. And I think that there's ways to be able to improve that. You know, but gun violence is a thing, so what would you do to help uh, prevent or reduce gun violence? There was a report in the LA Times came out and they studied all the mass murderers from the 1995 till the present time, what motivated them, and the number one issue was adverse childhood experiences. It was a number of bad things that happened in their childhood that a child never recovered from, and that was the number one motivator for mass murderers. And, uh, uh, truly, it is, uh, in, in, in my view, the damage done to kids from broken and dysfunctional homes that leads to this kind of violence, no matter how it's carried out. And it's a problem with our culture. It's not a problem with uh, guns. Mr. Tungipa, uh, what can be done to reduce gun violence? I believe it's support Prop 36. I think that criminals are given full control of this state. And so and I'm honored to be the honorary co-chair for Prop 36 because we've got to rein in crime. And we can't go after law-abiding citizens that are gun rights. I've been a shooter since I was young. I used to shoot in competitions. And the gun itself never committed a crime. It is the people behind the gun. And so we've got to focus on that, on t handling crime, and really take, take these individuals off the streets that are causing people to feel unsafe. So working, focusing on Prop 36, promoting strong, strong uh, areas where we're really focusing on tackling the issue of crime is the number one area where we could solve those issues. Are there any types of weapons that the public should not have? I don't, what do you mean by like, that? Like, I don't know, should bazookas be allowed to be sold in the store? I mean, is there any guns or, or any type of weapons they say, you know, maybe that shouldn't be sold to the public? You know, I, again, I just don't, I don't see whether it's California. If California was able to make up policies that were working, I think it would reflect, and they don't. Uh, any weapons that should not be available to public? It's a slippery slope, David, and uh, once you get on that track, you, the people start taking, the, the government will start taking every gun you got. And uh, the problem is that we're just not focused on the real issue at hand. And are you a gun owner? And if so, uh, what kind of gun do you have? I got a 12 gauge shotgun. Mr. Tonkipa? I have too many to count. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm sure uh, Rob Bonta may be able to count, but uh, that's another issue. All right, uh, both of you are Republicans, and it can be lonely in Sacramento. So how will you be effective when you're going to be likely part of a super minority, uh, Mr. Rodonovich? I think uh, that's a fact. You go up there uh, being part of the super minority, and you've got to have a plan to be able to get a balance of power back in uh, Sacramento as fast as possible. There's, there's one thing that is just destroying this state, and that is the single party rule of the Democrats. And it will not take just working in the legislature to chip away and make bad laws a little better. It's going to have a, it'll take a, a bold plan that'll have to be, uh, 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 some of the efforts would be made in the state legislature, but also massive a boost in the party power through in the state, and the case will have to be made in to the uh, uh, general populace as well. I was uh, fortunate to, to come back from Washington, D.C. just recently. We celebrated the 
30-year anniversary of the uh, contract with America and was during a time when we were stuck in the minority in Washington for 40 years and we came up with a plan Newt Gingrich the 10 items that it would take to, in order to to uh, and ask people to vote for you so that we could change that dynamic and get the majority once again in Washington and it was we need the same type of thing here and we need a list of about five to ten issues that both the party can promote and that we can go and advocate to the Ameri to the <laughs> to the California people to give them the excuse to come back to the party and start electing Republicans so that we can get into a balance of power as fast as possible. And Mr. Tungy, but how do you break through when uh, you're going to be outnumbered? Mm -hmm. Well, I actually, I could tell you about how we already have broken through. Uh, again, I worked with Senator Shannon Grove on a bill called SB 14, which did a few things very simply, and it made child sex trafficking a felony and a strikeable offense in California, and that was originally killed by the California Public Safety Committee. but. That didn't stop us. What I was able to do was modernize our ability to reflect the people and the general people of California and show them that the California Public Safety Committee got up and walked out when all we were trying to do was protect kids and make it the same level as arson, robbery, and burglary. I created a public pressure campaign that actually focused and spotlight those issues. It activated over 4 million people. 90,000 people wrote to the governor's office and he forced it to the floor and we got it done. That is doing something different that we have not tried before. That is a big portion of my campaign is to modernize this, this message because people know gas isn't working for them. Grocery costs are too high. Insurance is too high. California has one party rule and we've been in 30 years of this single party rule. It's time to do something different. So what would be the first piece of legislation you propose? One of the number one areas that I'm looking at is taking on the cost of our energy right now. We have these policies of scarcity that limit, whether it's hydroelectrical facilities, to be on our green and renewables portfolio. I see, and I had to deal with this, so I lost my father earlier this year, and I've had to take on and take care of my family's mortgage on that end on top of my own. And one of the areas that is killing us is our utility cost. And yet California has created policies of scarcity which limit the supply and increase the demand. We have to free up cutting cost, cutting regulation, free up businesses will make it easier on everybody. Mr. Donovich, what would be the first piece of legislation you propose? I, I would introduce ACE legislation, which uh, uh, declares ACE's adverse childhood experiences a statewide emergency. It would allow communities to start collaborate to, uh, to be able to, to drive down those occurrences. It would uh, uh, create uh, a certain amount, like um, in the state budget, 40% of it is uh, mandated to be spent on public schools. I would uh, mandate 40, 50 percent of health and human services to fund the projects to increase ACE awareness throughout the state and uh, remediate them. That puts us on a track to uh, uh, restoring families in this country and that is the common denominator of full prisons, crime, uh, uh, poor educational standards, um, uh, y you name it. It is the common denominator thing. That is a bipartisan thing that can be worked out with Democrats and then I would attach it to a bill, a, a list of things to take to the public th through the party hopefully that it would include that but it would also include a repeal of props 47, 57 and AB 109. It would repeal uh, AB 32, the global warming initiative and it would uh, repeal or revise CEQA and also Prop 103 which has destroyed the insurance industry in California and the, the package of those things will prove to the uh, to, will be so alluring as a fix for California that it'll it'll bring voters over to our side so that we can finally change that dynamic of uh, being in the uh, insignificant minority in Sacramento as quickly as possible. Mr. Tungipa, in a mailer, Mr. Rodonovich called you a rhino, a Republican in name only. So what Republican values do you hold? You know, I look at this as, you know, George is focused on my campaign. And really, it's just every single one of his mailers has actually tried to point out or attack or go somewhere else. And his focus is he's running against me, and I'm running for California. I've been working in this area. There we see uh, that the mailer there. there? Hmm? Well, and again, everything that he's come up with there, I actually, I don't know how he can say that I'm Gavin Newsom's best friend when I'm an honorary co-chair for Prop 36, that Gavin Newsom has been running against the entire time in the work that I've put in. I can't say how 
he's I'm Gavin Newsom's best friend. If I've worked to pass legislation with Senator Grove, and not only that, I have Jim Patterson support, Lisa Smithcamp support, 14 other members of the assembly, four other senators, because of the work that we have put in. And while he's running against me, I'm running for California. And I hope people see through a lot of these attacks. Because if you look at his record, his record will reflect that he supported $1.1 billion to the IRS. He's running saying that he's going to support farmers, but the legislation that he authored and wrote took water away from farmers. And right now, we're focused on what can we do today to fix California. I have gotten more done now than any other person at this table. So, Mr. Rajanovich, why'd you call uh, Mr. Tungipa a rhino? Well, I, I, here's what I think. I think the tax record is the, the difference between Dave and Naya's experience, and I've got a long track record of being uh, anti tax, anti regulation, pro gun, pro life. It's in the record. We don't know anything about David Tangipa other than the fact that he's, he endorsed a tax increase of $1.6 billion placed on the backs of Californians. Uh, boy, it really impacts the poor and the middle class. That's the record he has to speak of. And so the public needs to know about that. And that's why I've been endorsed by the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, Congressman John Duarte, Congressman uh, Tom McClintock, uh, Frank Bigelow, the former assemblyman, David Pachigian, a number of county supervisors, and the Fresno, Madera, Tuolumne, Calaveras Republican parties who are not very happy with David portraying himself as a rhino to try to get Democrat votes in this race. Mr. Tungup, a quick rebuttal? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think it's unbefitting of uh, a former congressman who actually wants to talk about building up the party, and yet he just stated right there that we don't know about David, so we'll make it up. We'll make up an economy plan that has nothing to do because he's stuck in the past. I supported the voters' right to choice on that when it comes to here in Fresno County. He didn't take a position earlier today because he doesn't vote in Fresno County, but yet he takes that same position now on a different measure. You know, George ran for office for uh, supervisor in 1988, then ran for Congress, then ran for Senate, now has run for assembly and has started his campaign, openly campaigning that he was using this seat to run for another one. I am focused on the people of Assembly District 8. I want to service those individuals and I'm here to work. Yeah, George? You know, I think people know me and they know I ran for Congress and served until 2010 until when I walked away to return to Mariposa to raise my son. And that was uh, in 2010. I'm getting back into politics because I'm just disgusted about the direction the state is taking. And we need to not only revive things in Sacramento, but revive the Republican Party, which is only 25 percent of the registration uh, in California. We're always going to be in an insignificant minority when you do that. But my opponent has has. Uh, uh, He's attacked volunteers who work to recall Gavin Newsom. He's received thousands of dollars from public employee unions in Sacramento. He's remained silent while your Sacramento lobbyist friends send out a mailer attacking the Republican Party and my Christian faith. He's received left-wing left endorsement of the Fresno Bee, and he told the Bee that you would check with Democrats in legislation before taking a position. Added to that the fact that he supported $1.6 billion in tax increases, I say it calls him a rhino. Right, we'll get to measuring in just a moment. Uh, Mr. Tungi, uh, you called Rondovich, or Mr. Rodonovich, a sellout. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, actually, if you reflect that, and I don't know if you have it, um, when that issue, that actually that issue came up, and that was a print issue, not on our end, um, but that is actually a record a record of exactly what was voted on. And I think that's what people need to know. And I'm saying sellout is the action. If you believe that that is negative, those, whether it's $700 billion to bail out Wall Street, $1.1 billion to the IRS, and also taking away farmers, that is factual, not coming up with a, some random economic plan. And not only that, George says all of those things that recently where as a congressman, he says that he's fighting against PG&E and yet has taken $27,000 from PG&E. You know, if we look at the record of what he has voted and what he has authored, instead of coming up, I'm not an elected official. I work for elected officials and I work for this district to support and do the things that we need today. If experience of the past is what's gotten us here today, can we keep doing the same thing? I think political insanity is voting for the same people and expecting different results. George will be 81 years old after serving a full term in the assembly. And I think a people are looking two years, after serving not, yeah, in the well. assembly. And I think people are looking to take the next step for their kids and grandkids. Because we see today the average home price is $900,000. People are getting their insurance costs and it's 
$12,000 a year just for insurance. We have to do something different. If we continue down the same path, if we continue to vote for the same people who have a clear track record of selling people out, then we, we're going to get the same old, same old here in California, and we're working to be different. Do you have a problem with his age? Do, I don't have any problem with his age. Mr. Donovan, you want to reply to all this? I frankly don't know where to start. I, I will say, though, that you can take votes that were listed there from 2001 and uh, around that time, and you can twist them to turn into every, anything. As you know, Congress, after we balanced the budget for four years, uh, Congress turned to passing omnibus bills that, you know, you don't know anything in there. And, and frankly, I wouldn't be endorsed by the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, which is the gold standard for, uh, uh, for um, tax re responsibility. I wouldn't be endorsed by them if, if any of that stuff was true. And there's a reason why he doesn't endorse, they don't endorse David Tanja, but because he's for raising taxes. And I'm, I'm obligated to share that with the uh, voters of the district. Now, Mr. Tongipa, you recently wrote on social media that uh, Mr. Rodonovich used an image of you in his mailer that you were unhappy about. Uh, why, why don't you explain that a little bit? I think that's something that everybody needs to know, especially when it comes from a former congressman that has resorted to name calling, but not only that, has done something that we haven't seen before. Uh, he used an image from a memorial that I did for my father, who I lost earlier today, or earlier this year in March, and then sent that same mailer on my father's first heavenly birthday. That was a direct and targeted area. And is that what we want when it comes to character? When it comes to character, representing the people here to take the next step. And my positions are fighting for California, every single one of his mailers. He has not put a single plan out there. I am focused on reducing the cost of living. I am focused on cutting state taxes and supporting local control because the locals know what to do. He is focused on taking on me. I am focused on taking on California. And a quick reply? You know, one of the first things I saw, I did for David after he saw him as, as when his father passed away was to offer my condolences to you. You know that. And uh, I, these pictures are in the public domain. I have nowhere idea where that picture came out. You might want to put the mailer on there because what his real issue is is that he's he's frustrated because I'm telling the uh, the people of this district that he's for raising a 1.6 billion dollar tax on the American people. He's been in he and Kamala Harris have been endorsed by the Fresno Bee and he doesn't like the fact that these issues are coming out because he has to defend them. There I wouldn't I lost my dad. I know how horrible that is. I would never stoop to doing something like that. And, you know, if, if, if it's a problem, it's your problem. I'm sorry, but I've expressed my condolences. I know how awful that is to you, lose your dad. Well, and, and, I, and there was no, no intention. And that, to me, it's, it, you're, you're, you're really reaching, pal. All right, Mr. Talking about it real quick. You. Well, he brought up the other ones that something had to do with attacking his faith and attacking the Republican Party. It states on there, not endorsed by a candidate on that mailer, because I had nothing to do with it. He signed off on this and that screen capture was not a picture it was a video so you had to have watched the video and it includes my father's birthday on that he passed away and we celebrated his first one I'm working for this family because I know what families are going through I take care of my family being in this position because I grew up my mother immigrated here from the island of Tonga my father was a veteran who served this area. I had the opportunity to break generational poverty through a scholarship to go play football at Fresno State. I'm the first person to graduate my degrees. I started my business focusing on first-time home buyers and veterans to pull those same people out of poverty like myself. And it's unfortunate. Again, I have released what I'm talking about, taking on the state, taking on crime, taking on all of these areas and focusing on local controls because we cannot trust those from the past to solve the issues that they created. I asked George this, why didn't he fix those same issues when he was in power in Congress? And now he can save these issues now as in the super minority? When what have you done that is different than what was done back in the 1990s? What have you done that is different from the 1980s? And can you not say that you created the issues that we have today and now you're expected to solve what? the ones that you created, when you say that you're fighting for water for farmers, when you wrote the bill with Dianne Feinstein to take no less than 250,000 acre feet of water a year from them that put west side farmers against east side farmers, you're now running to go against your own bill? When you were in power, 
that doesn't make sense to me. And yeah. so while I'm focused, we're working. You want to respond on the water accusations? Yeah, you know, the Front Water Authority lost a lawsuit in, in uh, court. They settled the lawsuit between themselves and an environmental group. They were desperate to get it passed, so they asked me for help because Friant, the water users, asked me to help them. And so they endorsed it, and so I passed it. It got him out of uh, a bad situation, and I do it again. I will say one thing, too. There's never been a stronger advocate than me for California agriculture and water and labor. Nobody has been a better advocate for agriculture in California than me. And, uh, you know, I, th nobody wants to turn water down the river. But this was approved by the Friant Water Authority to get themselves out of a bad situation. And it would have been politically expedient for me to say no, but it would have been far worse because they lost in course, they supported the agreement, and they asked me for help, so I helped them. All right, let's uh, move on. Measure E, it was the Fresno County uh, or sales tax proposed that would help Fresno State. It did not pass, but Mr. Tongi Pai, you, uh, you supported it. Uh, but also on your website, you say uh, you believe in lowering costs by opposing higher taxes and needless regulation. So I'm wondering if you can um, you know, explain your support for Measure E. Yeah, well, when it comes to Measure E, as I had talked about, I had my own personal connections there. But also, I didn't support it in the sense I didn't advocate for anybody else to vote for it because the only campaign that I was working on was my campaign for this area. But I look at the things that Fresno State and the issues that are coming down the pipeline. I do not believe that Sacramento can save us, and I support that the people's right to choose on that vote. And they voted to reject it, and I respect it. Where are you on Measure E in funding Fresno State? Uh, no, I was against it. But David says that uh, he supported the uh, Measure E tax increase because Fresno State's been good to him. And I, I got to tell you, I've been in politics. People are going to be really good to you when you're elected and if you're in Sacramento. And it just tells me that he's too naive and gullible to be, uh, be, be going to Sacramento to, to carry the water there because there's just too many people are going to be nice to you. And then that's not a reason to be supporting something. Just talking about a quick rebuttal to that? Yeah, well, I look at it. Nobody promised me anything that was good to me. I look at the issues that we have in the Central Valley. We have a 1,600 bed shortage when it comes to hospitals. We need more nurses. I look at the ADA and the economic value of what this area can produce. Um, if we support that type of infrastructure, and again, I support the people here locally to have that ability to choose. And we're stuck in the past when it comes to that. Measure E is a non-issue. And I also want to correct my statement when it comes to the Measure C. I support the iteration that it is currently right now with the Fresno Board of Supervisors. I do not know what 2026 is going to come because I can't speak into the future of that. So I have no idea what any of that. The current iteration is controlled by the Board of Supervisors. I work for the Fresno County Board of Supervisors. I think they do a better job because Sacramento doesn't know the issues of Fresno, because Sacramento doesn't know the issues of Madera, and because Sacramento doesn't know how to take care of our foothills. We need to dial it back to local control. Stop the centralization that is happening in Sacramento. Stop empowering Washington elites to really have their ability here because their record of the past reflects what's going to happen in the future. Nobody's been good to me. I've just been putting in the work. So what is the best way to fund local colleges and schools? I think it should go back to the local level. I think the cities, the counties, they can take care of themselves. It should not be at the state level, and that's why I'm going to the state to fight all of the state, cut regulation, and cut state taxes. <clears throat> People need to keep money home. We, we get less. Look at what Clovis is doing. Clovis is actually doing more with less, and they don't get backfill funding from the state because they don't have enough disadvantaged or low income or uh, diverse students but yet they do more with less because they can do better. They can take care of the kids better. Let's empower our locals because every single time Sacramento passes a bill, they're saying to you, we don't trust you to take care of your dollars. Well, I'm sorry, I don't trust Sacramento. That's why I'm going to expose, highlight, educate, cut and gut regulations. Mr. Rodonovich, how do you fund schools and higher education? Fresno State was is, uh, is owned by the state of California and that's why the sales tax initiative, placing that burden on the back uh, taxpayers of Fresno County was just wrong. What I would do, you know, K through 12 and junior colleges are funded by bonds and uh, state colleges are not. I would wrap them into that bonding process so that they have a funding mechanism to be able to uh, improve the buildings and, and uh, uh, improve the quality of education that they, they serve. That would be my solution for Fresno State because it is a state responsibility. Speaking of bonds, there are several bonds uh, for local school districts. 
Clovis Unified, Central Unified, Fresno Unified, State Center, all have bonds. Uh, you add all those up, it's going to be in the billions. So I'm wondering, uh, where are you on these bonds, uh, just these four major ones, Clovis, Central, Fresno, and State Center? Uh, Mr. Rodonovich. Leave it up to the local communities to decide. I'm not taking a position on any of them. Mr. Tongipa. When it comes to that, again, I leave it up to the locals, and it, that was the same position that I had when it came to Measure E as well, so leave it up to the locals to vote on that. All right, well, you, you live in Clovis. Where are you going to be on the Clovis Unified bond? When it comes to Clovis Unified, no new taxes. So you can vote no? Uh, uh, when it comes to Clovis Unified's bond, it's keeping the same rate. So I vote, I, actually, I support Clovis Unified. And what about State Center? That, I'm not familiar. Well, it's a similar bond, you know, similar idea for the community college yeah. district. Leave it, like I said, leave it up to the locals. Okay, you're a local. You're, you're voting in this one. Mm -hmm. So do you know how you're going to vote on this? That one, like I said, I, I really have not because the only campaign that I'm focused on is mine. All right. And, uh, and Prop 36, too, because I, I co-chair well, we'll, for we'll get to that in just a sec. <laughs> just a sec. Um, listen, there are various state plans. Another thing that seems to come out of Sacramento, let's tax the rich. Let's tax those who make 100000 200000 400000 So, uh, you know, stay in position on where you are in raising taxes for high-income earners, Mr. Rodonovich. No, I mean, it's just like uh, not in favor of raising taxes. California is not suffering from uh, uh, not enough tax. It's suffering because we've been overtaxed and overregulated, and the state government has assumed too much control over people's lives. And, uh, uh, you know, right now we have that insignificant minority of Republicans in uh, uh, Sacramento that can't affect any of that. And my job is to work with the legislature, work with the state party, and work with the people of California and give them a reason to come back so that we can start repealing the bad laws that the single party Democrats have been passing over these last few years and then, um, and then begin to re reduce regulations and taxes, free people up to be able to uh, uh, grow the economy in California. It's really, the only way to get out of this is to give people more freedom and take away the, uh, repeal the bad laws that have been passed and the, and the regulations and free them up. So, uh, it's going to take getting a balance of power in Sacramento as fast as we can. I've got a plan for it. And uh, so that's that's how I would deal with it. Mr. Tonkin, let's hear your plan now. I, I'm going to assume that you're not in favor of taxing the rich. Uh, so how are you going to prevent uh, your colleagues and Democrats uh, from doing so? Well, they, you have to look at what's happening right now. We're in a $72 billion deficit here in California, and that's projected in between. California's not working. And they're looking for more and more dollars here and there. We've got to cut regulation. We've got to tighten our belt. We cannot trust Sacramento to control our dollars. You can't have a $98 billion surplus in 2022 and a $72 billion uh, deficit in 2024 and say, trust me, I can, can manage your money better. Sacramento can't do that. My job and what I'm going to look at with this deficit that we're in, we're going to have to cut. And we're going to have to either cut teachers, police officers, and firefighters, or we're going to have to cut regulation. And what I want to do is show that these regulation company, these regulation and administrative agencies are struggling and smuggling, sorry, are strangling our businesses here. If we can free our businesses to take care of themselves, if we can free, whether it's the forest, to properly manage our forest, if we can free all of these companies, businesses, and individuals from California regulations, that's where we can really save money. We don't need to tax more people. We spend more dollars per student in California, and yet we have 50 out of 50 when it comes to literacy rates. We spend more dollars per individual when it comes to our roads, and yet we don't have that infrastructure. The solution is not give more money to Sacramento. The solution is power locals. All right. A lot of propositions on this ballot, uh, 10. I want to go through them uh, with you guys. We're going to do, do them briefly since <laughs> there are a lot of them. Um, for Prop 36, it's uh, increased penalties for repeat offenders, uh, <laughs> repeal some of Prop 47. Just uh, give me you know, the brief stance of where you are and why, Mr. Tonkipa. Well, as an honorary co-chair for Prop 36, I think uh, I'm a huge supporter. And it's easy. Prop 36 does three things. It adds mandatory drug treatment programs so we can take people off the road and not leave them there and not expect them to take care of themselves. Because I have family members that were addicted. They could not save themselves. We need to give our tools back to the sheriffs and DAs, again, our locals, to take care of those people, the homeless that are addicted to drugs. Number two, it goes after people who deal fentanyl. 
And if they're caught on the second time dealing fentanyl, they can be charged for murder. Because right now, 112,000 people in the United States died from fentanyl overdose. And yet it's less punishable than heroin, crack, and uh, cocaine in California. That is an issue. And the third thing that it does is that it creates repeat offenders so we can sentence them again because we see that businesses are getting hit over and over and over again. We need to put those people away. I was the victim of a smash and grab. They were out within 24 hours and they hit 15 vehicles that same day. We've got to fix this and I've put in the work so that way we can get Prop 36 and get California back on track. Mr. Donovich, Prop 36. I love Prop 36. I'll be voting for it and uh, applaud David's efforts on it, but it's too little, and it's, it, it may be a great start, but uh, we need to repeal Prop 47, Prop 57, and AB 109. Uh, those laws were passed uh, in large part by Jerry Brown, who, who uh, his answer to prison overcrowding was not build more prisons, but just release criminals onto the street. And, uh, uh, and then the, the smash and grab legislation. So, you know, it, it's good to take bits and pieces of it, uh, but, but until we get a uh, balance of power in Sacramento, and that means uh, an, um, Republicans out of the insignificant minority, we're never going to be able to do all the things that need to be done to fix this state. So <clears throat> while I applaud and are supporting Prop 36, there's an awful lot more that needs to be done, and uh, it needs to be in a wrapped into a package that you can present to Californians and say, this is what needs to be done to fix our state and, and, and uh, in such a way that it causes them to leave the independent party, the Democrat party, and come back to the Republican party so that we can elect more Republicans and, and achieve that balance of power. We're right. always vulnerable until we get to that point of balance of power. Another hot one, Prop 33, which uh, deals with rent control. It would make it easier for some cities to enact rent control. Uh, where are you on Prop 33 and rent control in general? Uh, no, absolutely not. And I think my solution for this is to, to get rid of CEQA. Uh, CEQA is a state environmental review law. And it's, there are 16 states that have a state environmental review law. California, by far the most punitive. Uh, not only does it uh, require environmental review for state projects, but local projects, federal projects. It includes uh, private projects. and it in, and it, has on, like a, the cherry on top, all kinds of global warming provisions on it, is by far the most restrictive in the state. It's no wonder California is completely unaffordable, drives up the cost of, uh, uh, and the availability of housing. And so, uh, again, I view this as approach, California is suffering for, the, for, for what Sacramento and the, and the one party rule of Democrats have created here. We've created our own problems, and for, for them, it's, it's much like going after the oil industry for price gouging when <clears throat> they're taxing the bejeebers out of, uh, out, of, out of gasoline with a gas tax. It's the same thing with uh, trying to get rent, rent control. You're not going to what the problem is. The problem was all the, all the uh, restrictive regulations and rules that have been put on industry to make to price homes out of the market and make them less available. Mr. talking about rent control, Prop 33? Absolutely not. Absolutely no on Prop 33. I have my own real estate business that, again, that I've helped people do that. We don't have a housing crisis. We have a housing supply crisis because California has created those same policies of scarcity. It's actually why there's a big reason why I focus on forest management. Right now we have over 200 million dead trees in our forest. If we were able to take that same timber, create mass timber sites, and then build housing through proper forest management, that is one of my main objectives because I worked on the Creek Fire with Supervisor Magsig, and I've seen the devastating effects. If we're able to get back to forest management, we could reduce people's cost of insurance simply, simply by reducing the risk of fire. We can then take that same material and actually focus it because you can't have affordable housing without affordable material and use that here. If we uh, artificially limit the supply, we're going to see these high costs. We need to build more housing. That is the solution. We don't need the government to tell us that you can rent your property or not. Let's look at what's happening in different countries right now, like Argentina. Well, they got rid of red control well, let's and focus, the prices are coming down. <laughs> but we got, we got, uh, let's go in the lightning round. Just a yes, no on these rest of these props. Uh, prop 2, $10 billion school bond. No. No. Prop 4, $10 billion climate change bond. No. <laughs> Prop 5, it lowers the voting threshold to bond for affordable housing from two-thirds to 55 percent. No. i just make it easy on you. No on everything but 34 and 36. Okay. Um, so 
<laughs> Same here. <laughs> okay. Uh, just for the record, that's Prop 6, uh, banning prison labor. Prop 32, increasing the minimum wage to $18 an hour. Prop 34, preventing uh, health care <laughs> organizations like uh, the AIDS Health Care Foundation from political spending. Prop 35, making permanent taxes on certain health care plans. And then uh, Prop 3, which would fix the Constitution to eliminate the one man, one woman provision of marriage. You guys are both against that? Change yeah. the Constitution? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Which one is it? Prop 3 about the gay marriage? It's already the law of the land. Okay. Now, in the same realm of uh, gay rights, Fresno County has set up a committee to review whether certain books should be in the children's section of the library. There's a state law that would ban banning books. So where do you stand on this? I'll start with Mr. Tangipa. Yeah, I think I've actually seen some of these books that are in our, our public libraries. I believe parents should have the right to review them, and that's why I worked with Fresno County. So people had, parents could come in and see. There are some things that are on our books right now that should not be in schools that are inappropriate to talk about. Parents really need to know what their school and their education is. I think school boards, we should not give the state power to do it. We should empower our local school boards to do that. I did not support AB 1098, which centralized all the power of our school boards under the Department of Education. We've got to repeal AB 1028, 1098, sorry. Ms. Rodanovich, uh, this Fresno County Library Review Committee and the state law, where are you on it? Uh, the state law is, is just another example of the one-party rule in Sacramento that does, is relentless about cutting the legs out from underneath moms and dads in this state. They've been, their religion is to basically destroy the family, and this is just another example of it. Books are banned in schools all the time. It's called discretion, and uh, the decision makers that, that decide what is should go into a library and not, they make decisions all the time about that. Who would ever think that in today's world that, that is uh, uh, some of the stuff that is allowed on that uh, sexual orientation and uh, exploitation and, and, uh, and such, it, it, uh, the sexualization of our kids is, is, is demonic, I think, in this country. And I think uh, there's the, uh, all the discretion should be allowed to keep that stuff out of the schools, and I think that uh, the state needs to get out of uh, parenting, and uh, we need to start honoring our moms' dads now by respecting their right to raise their kids. You know, Mr. Ronovich, I'll stick with you on this next one. Should trans women be able to participate in girls' and women's sports no. in high school and college? No. Why is that? Just because they're men, and they're ruining the sport. Mr. Tonkipop. As a former athlete, no. I should not be able to play in women's sports. I think that's protected through Title IX. They have their own space. I think I'd be a pretty good basketball player if I was on that other side. I played Division I ball. I know that there's a difference, and we need to protect women's sports. I mean, look at the Mountain West. San Jose State has a, a man on the women's volleyball team, and there are multiple teams that have forfeited games because girls and women are losing their ability. That is not right. We need to protect women's sports. Fresno State still has a game coming up against San Jose State Volleyball. Should they consider forfeiting? I, again, I think that should be up to the team. They should see what's important and then decide from there. If it was me, again, I don't believe that men should be playing in women's sports. In the Fresno State question, should they uh, forfeit the game to San Jose State? Kind of up to them, but, uh, if, but if I were the team, I'd forfeit. All right. Another big issue uh, coming out of Stack Fenno, benefits for non-citizens. You know, what services and benefits should be extended to non-citizens? We recently saw Assemblymember Joaquin Arambula. He had a bill that was passed by the legislature that would uh, give mortgage benefits. That, that was actually vetoed by Governor Newsom. So, Mr. Rodanovich, uh, I, where, where, what kind of benefits should be extended, if at, any at all? None, and it's all the better example of why uh, we need to desperately, as soon as possible, get to a balance of power in California because the fact that the state's even considering stuff like this is just insane. And uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, I've i got to tell you, after watching this administration, Biden administration over the last four years with open borders and just letting everybody across, I'm for moving some of these illegals back and getting them, deporting them. I mean, I, I, I think it's gotten that bad in this country. And for us to, as a state to be considering giving uh, benefits only opens the gate, the floodgates more. And uh, because the federal government doesn't have the guts to take on the issue to legalize an immigration system and make it legal and stop illegal immigration, doesn't mean that California has to, to absorb that. And I, I think it's just been a, uh, it would be a terrible incentive to increase the flow of illegal immigration in this country. And, 
you know, enough's enough. How do you go about deporting people? It was done uh, by the Eisenhower administration back in uh, the 1950s. It can be done again. Oh, that was like 70, 80 years ago. So <laughs> things, what? Have changed. things have changed. All right, Mr. Tungipa, um, should any benefits be bestowed upon non citizens? No. We're in a $72 billion deficit. And I already brought up the issue. If our kids are 50 out of 50 when it comes to literacy rates, and the average sixth grader, and this is something that no other legislator is talking about today, the average sixth grader in California education schools reads at a uh, third grade reading level, and yet they're moving them on. That same bill where they talked about $500 million towards down payment assistance for illegal immigrants, they also proposed $500 million reduction in education for our kids. That is a priority issue that we have here. We're not even taking care of Californians. How can we expand it? And I have a soft spot when it comes for immigrants because I sponsored my mother's immigration. I know what the process looks like. I did it for her. That is not where we need to be focused on. California dollars need to take care of Californians. We've got to solve our issues first before taking care of anybody else. But, you know, there are millions of immigrants, non-citizens, mm -hmm. living in California, living in Fresno. What do you do with them? Yeah, well, it really just depends. Again, when you look at it, was the first action that you came into this country committing a felony? You cannot reward that because then you only increase that. We've got to have our secure, we've got a secure border, so that way we can make sure we can take care of everybody together and do it the right way. You can't expect, you can't um, incentivize criminal activity. We've done that. That's why we're working on these different areas to just rein in. We want to solve the world's issues, but we can't even take care of our own kids. That's a priority issue, and we've got to make a priority taking care of the future. Right. Now, uh, in the realm of crime and in public safety, uh, if you're elected, what will you do to ensure that the California Highway Patrol hires enough new officers to keep the citizens and highways safe? The CHP today has one in six job vacancies, despite uh, recent pay increases in recent years. So, Mr. Dovanovich, how would you help the CHP recruit? Well, that's a good question. I, I, I think that uh, uh, we'd have to look at their salaries and, uh, and what they're being paid and what's, what is preventing more people from going into law enforcement. I do, I think, it's endemic uh, beyond highway patrol. It's in law enforcement in general. And it's been this state and their one-party rule that has basically been uh, taking the side of the uh, criminal rather than the victim. And the incredible disrespect for law enforcement uh, over the next few years, it makes it, it's not just highway patrol, but it's in law enforcement in general. <clears throat> that when the state becomes a pro-criminal state, and um, releases people out of prisons relentlessly and uh, won't keep them in jail, it, it, uh, it's, it's, it, um, it's for law enforcement, you begin to wonder why you're even doing the job. And I think that that has a, a very big part of it because local law enforcement is facing the same thing. And uh, we need to become a law and order state, again, where we are a citizenry that respects law and order and authority. And we don't have that right now. And so I think that, to me, is uh, something that needs to be fixed. And that's where I would do, that's the purpose of the ACE legislation that I'll be proposing um, in rebuilding the families is where those values and respect for authority comes from. And that's kind of where you need to start in order to make law enforcement uh, uh, respected again. And that's, I think, what will... Uh, uh, it'll stop the exodus of people signing up to, uh, to take care of us in this country and Mr. state. Mr. Tungipa, do you, do you get Ponce and John back on patrol? How do you help uh, the CHP uh, recruit more people? Well, I've actually been working a lot with the CHP because we've got many issues coming down the line. Uh, and I'm proud to be endorsed by the California Highway Patrol, uh, California Association of Highway Patrol, to take these issues. A lot of CHP officers are leaving because we do not support public safety and our public safety officials. We've got to get back to empowering our police officers to make people feel safe again. But not only that, they are overworked in a lot of areas. One of the number one issues, and actually the most dangerous thing, and I was with Captain Matalonis, uh, which is our local central division captain, talking about it. the number one most dangerous thing to do, even more dangerous than fentanyl in the Central Valley, is to get in your car and drive. More accidents happen right here and fatalities than actually do when it comes to, uh, that kill people than fentanyl. So we've got to help our CHP officers deal with these issues and give them the tools that they need uh, today. If we're looking at this, we, we are actually working on a study right now that shows that one-fifth 
of all the accidents that are happening are from uninsured, unlicensed, and illegal drivers, people who should not be on the road. We've got to add more enforcement on that area, pull these people off, we'll lighten the load on their ability to work, and then we also have to support them and support them up and down and believe that they're doing is the right thing. We saw what happened in 2016 and 2020. We've got to get back to being pro-law enforcement again, and that's exactly what I'm working on. All right, let's talk about the district itself. Uh, you know, District 8, Assembly District 8, covers Clovis, North Fresno, the traditional areas uh, that this area's been covered. But we go all the way up to the Nevada border, we go several mountain communities, and now this is drawn by the independent commission, uh, you know, that do it based on the census every 10 years. So do you think this redistricting is fair, is right? Uh, I, I, I think the panel uh, that does redistricting in California is a partisan panel. It's not supposed to be, but they draw districts that uh, isolate Republicans and benefit Democrats. And they're almost solely responsible for the fact that we're in the insignificant minority now. Um, you're always going to have a combination of rural and urban you know, you got to take care of all that property in Inyo County that stretches all the way down to Death Valley. They got to go somewhere, and uh, there's more land than people uh, there. But I think the the uh, we need to take over the redistricting plan for California to make sure it's equitable, to be able to not lump uh, Californians and push them clear to the eastern edge of the state. So I, I'm very happy to have re represented this area, of, uh, 80 percent of this district. Uh, in Congress for 16 years, and that's why people trust me to send me back to, to into politics in Sacramento. So um, I, I've got no problem. Uh, and the the mountain areas are wonderful places. I live there, um, but you know I understand the issues of the valley and Fresno and Clovis and and agriculture in the valley as well. So you got to be able to do it some way. But the current system of redistricting now is hugely uh, uh, partisan. And we need to get some balance back into that. Mr. Tungaba, is redistricting fair? Well, actually, that's one of the areas that I was working on. And I'm proud to be one of the chairs for the Valley Young Republicans and a former vice chair for the state as well. Uh, I sat on the redistricting commission. And I can tell you this, that commission once said that Fig Garden, and I mean, sitting in this meeting, they called it a historically black community. The community of Fig Garden here. And we had to call in and to let these people know that was inaccurate. And that's very inaccurate for the Central Valley and the people who live here in the Central Valley. So we have this commission that is redistricting the area, and they have no idea what represents what and where. And I think that there were partisan games that were played on that. What we've got to do, since citizens have to get involved again, we need people to apply for the redistricting commission because there wasn't anybody from the Central Valley. The closest individual on that was from Tracy, who was originally from the Bay Area. Is that who we should have redistricting our area? I don't think so. We've got to be more involved. 2030, I'm going to ask people to sign up for the redistricting commission and to pay attention because it matters to your life. It matters on how we have a district as large as this district. Assembly District 8 is 25,000 square miles, leads you into the entrance of Las Vegas and goes all the way up to the Arnold Calaveras border. I've, I bought my truck with 20 miles on it. I have now 64,000 miles working in this area, trying to service the district. It makes it extremely hard. We've got to get better at redistricting, and people need to play a heavy factor on that. Another voting-related question. We'll go with uh, Mr. Tungy upon this one. Should picture identification be required for voting? 100%. If you need an ID to open up a bank account, if you need an ID to buy things from a store, if you need an ID to get in your car and drive, you should have an ID to make sure that you have the right to vote. Mr. Donovich? Yeah, it really does need to. I, I think it preserves the chain of custody, and that's the... Uh, that's the real danger of things like ballot harvesting is because that it, it ruins the it destroys the chain of custody and I, and it makes it too vulnerable to cheating and uh, so yeah I, I believe in in-person voting with an ID and uh, you should have it in order to be able to get a ballot now another election issue that's putting the state and the county uh, together is when should the sheriff and the district attorney be elected uh, this county says uh, 2026 in the mid-year terms. Uh, the state wants it 2028, the presidential, presidential terms. Mr. Tangipa, what should it be? Well, you clearly know that that was Measure A that was on the ballot, and to keep our DA and our sheriff on the gubernatorial election. We did that because Fresno County should decide when it comes to their DA. Um, we know that the, this is weaponization of policy and people aren't seeing it. And those in the legislature know that on presidential elections, 
there are more turnout and they have the ability to play with that. We can't do it and that's why I worked with the Board of Supervisors to make sure that Measure A was there so that way we can decide on our own. Again, I support local control. Mr. Donovich, uh, why would your Fresno County DA and Sheriff be elected? Yet another example of uh, the one party rule in this state that plays with the electoral system to, to their advantage. It's the same thing with open primaries. They, we shouldn't even be having those. And uh, when it comes to manipulating the ballot for certain ends, I think it's unconstitutional, frankly. And uh, the only way that we can fix that is to get out of this permanent uh, insignificant minority of Republicans in Sacramento. And that's why I keep coming back to this balance of power, because all efforts need to be focused on that uh, by all means. And I've got the plan to be able to do it and, uh, and the credibility to be able to sell it around the state to convince more people to come back to the party, more independents and Democrats, and change the structure of uh, uh, politics in Sacramento. All right, well, we're coming time. We're getting close to the end of the hour. So I'm going to give you guys about 90 seconds each to make your argument. Why should voters pick you? What makes you the best choice? Mr. Tangipa, make your case. Well, again, thank you uh, for listening to us today. I think, again, people are looking at We are in California right now, and we're all tired of California can't. We can't afford gas. We can't afford groceries. We can't afford home insurance, and we can't afford to buy a home. And yet, what we're looking at today is taking the next step and leadership for your kids and your grandkids, because we know that there is a priority issue here in California. We have those, whether it's the DA and the sheriff, or we're talking about Prop 3, which are non-issues and have already been settled, and all of that. And yet, now we've got to focus on what can we do for you. And what I'm asking you is look at the work that we've been able to do. Protect kids through SB 14. I worked on that. Doing what we're doing right now with Prop 36, being an honorary co-chair, and also what we've done with Supervisor Magsig on focusing on protecting the people here, making sure that we have a fighter for the foothills and also a voice for the valley. I plan on doing that because I've got the energy it's going to take to take on California. I've got a 30-year plan, and I, ban I plan on being here in 30 years to put in the work because I know that when I have kids, I want them to be here in California. We've got to work on this together. We need new energy and new ideas, and that's what I plan on doing. Thank you. Mr. Rodonovich, uh, about 90 seconds. Thank you. I think what motivates me to come back and makes me excited about returning to politics, especially in California, is that I've got a plan to be able to flip the state. And, uh, and I am excited about being able to make the case to the Republican Party and making it strong again, and then uh, making the case to Californians that, that uh, this one-party rule in California is not doing anybody any good. They, the citizens of California are slowly beginning to, to realize that, but we can't wait until the pendulum swings back. Frankly, I think the pendulum is broken. What we need is a plan to restore the state and then the ability to move around the state and sell people in order to increase registration for Republicans and return a balance of power to Sacramento. And I, I think there's hope for California. I think we'll soon be to a point where people will stop leaving because the state's too expensive. And I'm excited to, to be able to uh, re-enter politics and flip this state. And that's my sole purpose of getting back involved in politics. Mr. Tungipa, Mr. Radonovich, thank you for this uh, last hour debate. Uh, we learned a lot. We learned a little bit of the differences, you guys, and your voters the most information. Remember, the election concludes November 5th. Voting's already started, so please get out there and vote. I'm David Taub. So long.